Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Elizabeth Knight, and she's here to share with us her new book, Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture. So when Elizabeth was new to the Hudson Valley, she visited a repair cafe and was so impressed by the fix-it skills and warm welcome that the volunteers extended to all the strangers who walked through the door, most of them clutching torn shirts, wobbly chairs, wonky lamps, and she started the first repair cafe in Orange County. Now, many of you probably know Elizabeth. She's very well known as a former tea sommole for the historic St. Regis Hotel located in New York City. She is widely recognized as one of the country's foremost authorities on tea and entertaining, and she has appeared on national television and radio programs including WNBC, Today in New York, WOR, Food Talk, the Travel Channel, the Home Shopping Network, QVC, and many more. So let's welcome our special guest, Elizabeth Knight. Thank you for inviting me. What an honor it is to have you here, Elizabeth, and to talk about this book. I think everyone needs a copy of this book. Oh my goodness, it is amazing. What did you particularly um, find amazing about it? Just one thing. Do you know what? You actually broke down, I think, a piece that so many people are just not really aware of, which is the throwaway culture. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners what that is. Well, the throwaway culture is the notion that this isn't working anymore, or I'm tired of it, or it's torn, and I don't know how to fix it, or if it's going to cost more to get it fixed than it is to just buy a new one. So let's just um, put it in the in the recycling bin if we can. Somebody else will take care of it. It'll go someplace else. And the problem is too much of it simply ends up in a landfill. And we can't keep doing that. It's like going back to the well too many times and eventually it runs dry. We need a better way. And we found that over the last as long as we've been encouraged to be uh, recycling, recycling only goes so far. Much of what we think is recycled, too much of it actually ends up in the landfill, or what, just a small portion of it is actually deemed reusable. So the first key to this is think about reuse before recycle, and in order to reuse it, either find a place to repair it, like a repair cafe or a fix-it clinic, or um, if you've got a handy neighborhood repairman, go there or learn how to do the repairs yourself. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I'm so glad you talked about that because there's so much waste in the world. And if we can eliminate just some of that and some of the spending and the clutter, I mean, it makes such a huge difference. And is that kind of some of the reason that, you know, I know you and your co-author wrote this book? Yes, and part of the reason is because both of us are um, activists, and my co-author, John Wackman, founded the first repair cafe in the entire state of New York in 2013, and in 2016, I started one and had contacted John Wackman for some suggestions about how to get more publicity for it and some other how-to tips, and over the years, we've... um, visited each other's repair cafes. We've talked about the movement. We've talked about the things we've learned since we started it. And we got started, actually, because John's repair skill is woodworking, and he will often visit repair cafes in the Hudson Valley and others, and Catskills. There's now about 40 of them. And he takes his toolbox to do wooden repairs. So he was doing one at a city called Beacon, which is in a county about an hour north from me. And a woman who had brought something in to be repaired uh, came up and sat down at his work table and said, they, they told me you're the man I need to talk to. She said, I've had the most wonderful experience here this afternoon, and I'm a literary agent, and I think there's a book in this. And that's what happened. And John had already started work on the book proposal 
I think he'd been into it about maybe six months. And he contacted me and invited me to be co-author, which was a bit of a surprise because I'd only been running my own repair cafe about four years. And he said that he wanted um, the stories that I tell. And, and I said, well, what exactly do you mean? And he said, well, it's that report that you send out after every one of your repair cafes. I, after every repair cafe, sit down and write up a an email report to send to the 30 people who volunteer for our repair cafe, whether they are the people uh, making the tea and coffee, whether they are the people doing crowd control or the people fixing the bikes, the lamps or the sewing. And I did it because I wanted them to know how much I appreciated and respected their gifts of their time and their talent. And it came out of, I used to run special events for a department store chain. And then I was an account manager and I would write up a similar report. How many people came? Where did they come from? Uh, what did they do? What things were fixed? What things weren't? What kinds of things did they bring in? What kinds of things did they say was wrong with it? Um, what Was there anything particularly significant that came out of it? Was there something that was really touching or funny or something totally unexpected? So that's what I put into the reports. And John said, this is what I think the book needs also. So I ended up writing more than just that, um, the community repair experience, but that's how I was drawn into it. I really love how both of you kind of collaborated in many ways and continue to do that with the Repair Cafe. I've got to ask, like, is there anything that you do not repair? Uh, yes, um, we have found that in many places, many repair cafes have decided not to repair um, something uh a, a tool like a, a, anything that runs on gasoline because it's smelly and it's loud and it's uh, a potential fire hazard. Uh, that said, there are a lot of the, the most typical things to, to be repaired are small electrics. Think lamp is the most popular item brought in all across the country. Um, also things like, oh, blenders, sewing machines, any, anything that you'd kind of put, toasters, irons, uh, hair dryers, um, bicycles, clocks, uh, textiles, like everything from a torn tablecloth to a torn pair of jeans to an ear missing on a, a favorite teddy bear. Uh, do small um, jewelry repairs, small scale wooden furniture. We don't do upholstered furniture, but if something needs gluing or needs to be nailed back together, we'll work on that. That said, some of the repair cafes have very interesting interpretations of what repair means. There's a woman at the New Pulse uh, Repair Cafe who's a licensed psychotherapist, and she offers soul repair. She says, uh, come in and sit down and tell me your story, and she listens to you for five, ten minutes, just listens. There's somebody else that uh, works with uh, Spanish-speaking people to help them complete forms that they need for school or jobs. Uh, there are two women who are licensed mas massage therapists, and you can come sit down in their chair and they'll give you a neck and a back rub for 10 minutes. There's somebody who does digital repairs to beloved tattered old photographs. We have a man who is an author, and he does what he, he, what he calls wordsmithing. So if you need a, your resume touched up, or you're trying to write a book proposal, or you need to write a difficult letter, you bring it in and he'll help you, quote, find your own voice. That is so impressive how there's all this community, you know, um, experience and um, just know-how out there that's helping other people to kind of re just repair everything. Well, the idea is, yes, we want to, we want to repair things so that they don't uh, end up in a landfill. And when I was first getting my my repair cafe off the ground, John said to me, you know, you, you think you're going to be keeping things out of the landfill and you will. He said, but it's more about sending the signal that there's another way to look at this. He said, we as individuals with the things that we bring into a repair cafe are not going to be the tipping point. It's It's the much larger manufacturing processes. But he said, the thing that you're really going to be doing is connecting and building community. And I thought, I don't know what he means by that. But the very first time that I did it, I saw it happen right in front of my face. Oh my goodness. Can you share that story with us? Um, I can share a couple of them. I love that. 
Well, one of them was, um, let me back up. When I was first starting the Repair Cafe and trying to get it off the ground and I needed some uh, publicity photos and had no budget to do it, I called the mayor of our town, Mayor Newhart, and said, you know those pictures that you do when people open a new business and there's a tape drawn across the door of a building and you stand there with a pair of big fake scissors and everybody smiles and he said, yes. And I said, I, I need help promoting this. He said, call the Chamber of Commerce. They'll set everything up. And they did. And one of the members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, took me aside after the photo and said, uh, you've got a, a woman standing here in the photo holding a lamp that I guess that means you're doing lamp repairs. Yes. She said, well, aren't you concerned about putting people out of business? And I said, where do we get a lamp repaired around here? And the lamp, as I said, is the most popular item at our first repair cafe. Fix It Bob, a former Navy CB, whose job, among other things, was repairing nuclear um, reactor sites on remote islands. And as Bob says, you don't wow. go down to the hardware store to get the part. He'd, he'd grown up, his dad was an electrician, and he learned how to repair things too. So Bob was repairing a lamp that a nine-year-old girl had brought in. And the lamp was one of a pair that had belonged to her grandmother and sat on the grandma's uh, nightstands. And grandma, grandma had died and the little girl had wanted the lamps, but it didn't work. So Bob said he taught the mother and the little girl how to diagnose what was wrong with it and how to replace a switch. And he said that that's, that kind of a literal and figurative connection about fixing things that have meaning is why he does it. And there's also something, have, do you know that, are you familiar with the term visible mending? No, I'm not. Okay. This is a really cool thing. It used to be um, the point of making, it was shameful to have, for many people, to have a visible repair on their torn shirt or skirt. It meant that you were too poor to replace it. Well, now the repair is not supposed to be invisible. It's supposed to be an opportunity for creation. You're supposed to see it. It's supposed to be creative. You don't match the threads. You don't match the fabric. You make something different that's a personal statement. Um, and everybody's from um, even guys who do skateboarding, you know, punk teenage kids are into doing this to repair their their either their clothing or even their equipment. Uh, and one of our repair cafe, um, what they call them sewist, S-E-W-I-S-T, not a seamstress. And it's a combination of the word sew and artist. And she says for her, the story is not, I bought this item on sale. The story is I tore it on a hiking trip with my husband on our honeymoon. And I want to remember that. So you embroider it in a way with a color that brings back maybe the cactus blossom that you saw, or it's a heart, but it is meant to make a visual statement. Oh my gosh. I love that. But there's also visible repair to people at a repair cafe. And one of the stories at my very second repair cafe, we were part of a pop-up repair cafe at a holiday fair where people were, artists were selling things that, that had been made with recycled and repurposed materials. So we had a woman who was doing jewelry repair and she does her, sells her own, she has her own jewelry shop on Etsy and she does a lot with vintage pieces like subway tokens. Anyway, we had to be out of there by whatever time it was because we were being replaced by a band for a private party. A woman comes in looking pretty distressed. She looked like she didn't take very good care of herself physically. And she looked like she needed some help, like her clothes looked rather shabby also. And she was holding a silver chain in her hand. And I went up and greeted her. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, we we're closing. We've got to be out of here in 15 minutes or more. In fact, we were supposed to be out of there by now. And she, I said, but there's another repair cafe next month. And she said, I can't wait. And I said, okay, there's a um, jewelry store downtown. She was late because she was lost. She'd been driving around 45 minutes. And she's, I don't have money to go to a jewelry store. I could have done that where I live. And I said, okay, well, we can probably, um, there's probably something on YouTube. And she said, no, I need it now. And I looked at her and I said, what's really the matter? And 
she pulled something out of her pocket. It was a little silver cylinder engraved. Um, and she said, this contains my grandson's ashes. And she said, I have worn it every day since his funeral. And she said, I can't be without this. She said, I need, please, I need this fixed now. So I went flying out to the parking lot and got Suzanne and said, would you please come back and take a look at this? So Suzanne, I told the band they'd have to wait, that this was urgent. And Suzanne sat down and repaired it. And while she was doing the repair, the woman told us the heartbreaking, tragic story of the loss of her grandson. And when Suzanne was able to fix the chain and slip the cylinder with his ashes in it and hook it around the woman's neck, she threw her arms around Suzanne and said, you don't know what you've done today. Mm. So. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'm crying just hearing this story because it's just amazing how a small thing can make such a big difference for somebody. And gosh, bless you guys for taking the time to do that. You know, here she really needed to have her grandson in, in that special way. Exactly. And speaking of small things, one time the sewing team was helping a, a young woman came in and she had a toy dog with the nose ripped off and the ear had been ripped off and she was small enough that it fit in the palm of her hand. And one of the uh, sewists called me over and said, you need to hear this story. And the woman had a big sparkly engagement ring on the other hand and her fiance was with her. And while um, Joan, who, who does um, teddy bear repairs for a living, she, Joan re takes people's um, unwanted fur coats that they've often inherited and she makes the fur coat into a teddy bear and uses the the silk lining of the coat with the original owner's initials to make a little scarf for the bear so Joan does our stuffed animal repair and this young woman's standing there with this toy dog in her the palm of her hand and the fiance tells us that the woman was a premature baby and she was so small her parents and the doctors didn't think she was going to survive the parents couldn't touch her, but they found this little toy dog that they were allowed to put in her isolate. And now this young woman obviously did survive and was going to be married and move to a new home. And she needed the toy puppy repaired because her real life dog had ripped off the nose and the ear. So it's the beginning oh. of a story and the end of a story. Oh my gosh, that is so sweet. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it, we all have these things that mean so much to us and they have probably no value to anybody else. But what a big difference it makes just to give that little bit of kindness, you know? Exactly. And that's what the, the people who do the repairs and teach others how to do the repairs are called repair coaches. And that's the thing that they say, over and over about why they do this, that how it makes them feel so special to have been part of fixing something that was so special for someone else. And it doesn't matter whether you know them or not. It's part of it, giving back to the world the thing that you've got, whether it's time or talent or both, or passing on the, the story I mean, that's, it's now at the point where the repair coaches at the Warwick Cafe will call me over and say, you have to hear this story, Elizabeth. You have to see what's the story behind a three foot tall lamp that is a ceramic of a flamenco dancer in an orange frilly skirt. Where did that come from? <laughs> so everybody becomes part of that. And you can, I, there was a man who, um, had been a Catholic priest and he came in and looked at the room and said, there's such a strong beam of love and hope coming out of this place. He said, you can feel it when you open the door. Oh my gosh, that is so amazing. And it's, you could see where that's so true for so many people, you know, and especially now, you know, people are really kind of being more conservative, you know, doing what we can at home, you know, and, and, you know, things are looking a little interesting. Who knows if, we're you know, going to be able to go out or, or not at all, but to be able to have something that you can look at in a different way going, gosh, I can probably repair this or go to a repair cafe and get it done. Right. And even though during the pandemic, many of the repair cafes um, are not in operation because you're in close proximity, you're sitting across the table from someone, you're handing tools back and forth, you're holding things together, your hands touch. We've had to, in an excess of caution, 
po- postpone that, but there's some great opportunities. The, Don Fick, the man who runs um, repair cafes in uh, North Carolina, has inaugurated Repair Cafe TV, and he sets up Zoom meetings where you hold your broken chair and you show it to the the camera and then a host of coaches drawn from around the world will look at it and say have you tried this get a tool and this is how you this is how you need to chisel off the old glue here's what you need to do it and and those sorts of things are getting much more sophisticated than they were even six months ago and one of the things that we were really pleased to be offering the book is we asked the repair coaches when I started doing this John and I discussed that we didn't want the book to be Hudson Valley centric. We needed to cast the biggest net possible. So I and a repair cafe organizer in Massachusetts kept passing back the kinds of questions that we would like to have answered to get a sense of how big is this movement and who does it and why do they do it and what kinds of people volunteer. And so we sent out a questionnaire across the country for any fix-it clinic, repair cafe, tool library that I could find. And I ended up getting well over 100 answers. And we asked these skilled fixers to give us a curated list of the uh, places that they go online to figure out where to get repair cafe types of information. And they said that... Um, YouTube was their go-to. One of, one of them described it. It's like having your dad walk you through it. And then they gave us their favorite YouTube videos. So even though you're at home, perhaps for the first time thinking, I ought to be able to put a patch on that, but I don't know where to begin. There is a whole list of curated sources in the book to walk you through it. Yeah, what a great list that is. I was so impressed with that. I'm like, gosh, I could be anywhere and something happens and I can get help. <laughs> Yes, from people who know how to do it and had a reason for for doing it. So many of them, you know, one of the things I'm often asked is, well, what kind of a person would volunteer to do something like this? And the the thing that's in common, whether they were male or female, is they were curious. Um, one one woman who brought her kid into her kids take it apart table that's an adult supervised place to exactly that said she'd come down from the bedroom stairs one morning and her four-year-old had taken apart the vacuum cleaner didn't know how to put it back together but he'd taken it apart (laughs) um most of the many many of the coaches were just like that as kids uh one woman who now organizes a repair cafe said she used to sit under the dining room table with a screwdriver and work on the leg of the table while people were talking above her Um, Oh my gosh, that's funny. And it's also people from all walks of life, whether they are currently employed or retired. We've got everything from bakers and beekeepers to Airbnb hosts, to lawyers, to nurses, um, to musicians, to advertising executives, to lots of school teachers, lots of retired engineers. They both like to teach uh, librarians. It's such a wide range. It's really anybody who has the will and the time to pass on something that they know. And if you're not skilled at using hand tools or a sewing machine, you can volunteer in a lot of other ways. We need people to help with publicity. We need people to help with um, making coffee and tea. You know what? You can never underestimate the power of coffee and tea, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's you know, a great motivator. <laughs> it is. And Martina Postma, the woman, she was the um, Dutch journalist who wrote about sustainability, called it a repair cafe deliberately. She wanted it to be a communal gathering place where people felt safe to gather and it would encourage conversation. And they could sit there and chat with each other while they were waiting to get something uh, fixed. And that's one of the most popular aspects of uh, the repair cafe is this opportunity. But, okay, um, you're third in line to have the lamp repaired and you're fifth in line to have your sewing, uh, your sweater looked at. Why don't you go have a cup of tea? And I used to be in the tea business and we, the description of tea for centuries has been it's a social lubricant. It's a warming liquid that you pour for your guests to make them feel acknowledged. Yeah, it's, it's a place to really kind of come together. And and gosh, I mean, these repair cafes, they just sound so amazing. i am you know been looking to see where's one in my neighborhood. Now, let's say if someone doesn't find one in their neighborhood, how do they start one? Okay, 
Um, first of all, to see if you've where to find it, I would say Google Repair Cafe um, Netherlands, and it'll come up with a map of all of those that have registered with the U.S. But if you want to learn how to start one, there's an entire chapter in the book. Um, that's one of the ones I wrote about look for any kind of a repair event in your area. Look online, look for a blog, look for a fix-it clinic repair cafe. If there isn't one, you want to start looking for a place to hold it. Libraries, churches, school gyms are among the most popular. You want to look for friendly active people who tend to tend to volunteer already for something else in the community. There seems to be a connection with people who volunteer to fix things are also people who fix things in their community, whether they're working for um, uh, Rotary, the Lions Club, uh, delivering uh, meals to people who are housebound, the food pantry. That's where you want to look. People who like to give, like to give to a pretty wide audience. And then We've got a whole chapter with how do you how do you write publicity? How do you where do you get the publicity? What kinds of tools do you need? Who's supposed to supply that? So all of the quote nuts and bolts are, are in the it's a it's a long discussion, but we we can walk you through step by step. How to do all that, how to get mm-hmm. started. Well, and so also have you ever come across anything that you're not legally allowed to repair? That's an interesting question. I don't think, well, actually, now that you say that, I remember one time a woman came into our repair cafe and said to me, yeah, you're, you're fixing all these great things, but I, I think you need to remember where you are. And I said, I'm not sure what you mean by that. She said, this is a rural area. There's a lot of farms. Our area is famous for its apple orchards and onions, among other things. And I said, okay, so what is it you think we're missing she said, you need to have horseshoeing. I said, inside the town hall senior center? She said, well, you could do that outside. <laughs> and I said, I don't think our insurance covers that. And she said, okay, how about dog fur cutting? And I said, I think we might have a problem with that with live animals inside and small children and um, things that are plugged in too. But I've never heard of anything else that was a problem. One of the other repair cafes that John runs in New Paltz has a guy who actually does spot welding, and he does it for a living, but he operates it out of his truck on the street, not inside the building. Wow, that that guy is just an angel to so many, let me tell you. (laughs) that uh, Yeah, I can understand why you're not doing uh, horseshoeing in a building. (laughs) Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Oh my goodness. Well, do you know, gosh, there's so much great information in your book. What do you want readers to take away from this book? We want readers to take away, number one, before you decide to throw it out or recycle it, see if it can be repaired and either look for sources to learn how to do it online or when repair cafes are up and at them, bring it in or read our book because we have a chapter called Adventures in Repair with how to do the most basic things like sew on a patch, um, fix a bicycle, uh, repair a wooden chair, that kind of thing. So what we really want to impress upon people is it doesn't have to be thrown out. It shouldn't be thrown out. We hope that when we can gather again, you will be inspired to bring something to a repair cafe or start one, but also the sense of, you can learn to do this. As we say, repair to learn and learn to repair, and we'll help you do it. Oh, my goodness, Elizabeth, you're such an angel to so many people. And I'm so glad that we've got this book now, Repair Revolution. I found it was such a great resource. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more, not just about Repair Revolution, but everything that you're doing? Um, our website, we have a brand new website, Repair cafe usa.org is a great site there will be information about other repair cafes across the country what they're doing what connections you can make and also check repair cafe uh, tv well elizabeth thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today 
Thank you. And I just want to say one thing, Marianne. I'm not the angel. I'm just the organizer. The, the angels are all the people who come and offer their time and talent. Well, it sounds like there are many angels that volunteer and spend their time there. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us here today. Again, if you'd like to connect with Elizabeth and learn more about Repair Cafe, you can at repaircafeusa.org for more information. Repair Revolution is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, New World Library, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, it's available on Kindle. You'll want to stay tuned for our next special guest, Katherine Sanderson. And she's here today to share with us her new book, Why We Act, Turning Bystanders into Moral Rebels. So we're going to pause here and take a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Mary Ann. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our next special guest, Katherine Sanderson, and she's here to share with us her new book, Why We Act, Turning Bystanders into Moral Rebels. So many of you know Katherine. She's been on the show before. She's a professor of psychology at Amherst College. She received a bachelor's degree in psychology with a specialization in health and development from Stanford University and received both master's and doctoral degrees in psychology from Princeton University. Professor Sanderson's research examines how personality and social variables influence health-related behaviors, such as safer sex and disordered eating, the development of persuasive messages, and interventions to prevent unhealthy behaviors. So let's welcome to the show, Professor Katherine Sanderson. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. Oh my goodness, Catherine, as soon as I heard you had this book available, I could not wait to have this discussion with you. I am so excited about this book. I've got to ask, like, what inspired you to write this? Well, it's actually a very sad story, and it happened just about three years ago now. My oldest child started college. We settled him into his dorm room. We drove home, and about two weeks later, 
I received a call one night and my son said someone died in my dorm last night. And then he told me this story. And the story is one that, you know, is frankly pretty familiar to all of us, which is that a student had been drinking in a dorm room on a Saturday night. He fell and hit his head and a bunch of his friends wanted him to be okay. They watched over him. They made sure he was still breathing, but what they didn't do for nearly 19 hours was call 911. And by the time they finally called, it was too late. And when my son told me that story, I was just struck as a mom, as a professor of all the ways that could have gone differently. And that honestly was the prompt to write this book, understanding the psychology of why they didn't step up and make a call sooner. I'm so glad that you wrote this book because we have heard time and time again of young people either drinking too much and being, you know, they pass out in the snow, things happen. And it's like, gosh, why aren't people speaking up when they should? Well, and, and what sort of is ironic, of course, is that we hear about it with college students, you know, fraternity and, and hazing and things, but it's actually a very human condition. I'll share another story, which feels particularly timely these days. And this is about a friend of mine who has a daughter. The daughter was adopted from China. She's now 21, 22, recently graduated from college in this March. So March of 2020, uh, this daughter is on a bus in Boston heading to work. When a man stands up, points at her and says, you should go back to China. You and your people are bringing us the coronavirus. You are killing Americans. So it's a crowded bus. The man stands up and is yelling at this, you know, poor young woman who, of course, you know, did did not bring the coronavirus to Boston. And not a single person on the bus stood up and supported her. Wow. Wow. That's just heartbreaking to hear that because I I don't know about you, but if I see something like that, I'm standing up going, do you know what, you know, you you just leave her alone or you would say something. Or, Or even just go over and support her, right? Sit beside her. But the reality is most people do not. Now, there are some people, as you've just noted, there are some people who do, but many people can think of times in which they've been in a a meeting or on public transportation or in a grocery store or whatever, and they saw or heard something problematic and they failed to step up. And often it's something that has haunted them, that they think back in their mind about, oh, should I have said something? Should I have done something? And for a variety of complex psychological reasons, they just fail to do anything. So when you were doing your research, what did you discover kind of holds people back from really kind of doing the right thing? Such an important question. And one of the reasons I I love talking about this topic is, frankly, understanding what holds people back is the first step in helping people step up. So to answer your question, there basically are three things. One, people don't exactly understand what they're seeing or hearing, that situations are ambiguous. So those college students, they thought their friend was just drunk and was going to sleep it off. They didn't recognize it was a medical emergency. Many times people hear or see something problematic and they are puzzled trying to make sense of what they are observing. You know, is that a harmless joke or is that actually kind of racist or sexist or homophobic? Maybe they see something and they can't figure out, is that sexual misconduct or is that somebody just being flirtatious? So in some cases, situations are ambiguous, so we don't speak up. In other cases, we recognize there's something that's a problem. But when we're in a group setting, we often hold back. There's a phenomenon that psychologists call social loafing. And this is the tendency for people to reduce effort in a group setting. It's frankly why restaurants impose a mandatory tip on parties of five or six or more because people tend to reduce their generosity in group settings. So another factor is in a group people slack off. But the third factor, and the one that I think is most prevalent, is fear of the consequences, that people worry. If I step up and say something, will I lose my job? Will people not like me? Will I offend my friends or colleagues or teammates? So fear of consequences also keeps people silent. And especially with the time we're in now, I think maybe some people might be afraid of getting hurt. You know, it's just kind of interesting, you know? 
Uh, well, absolutely. And there are, of course, some some really noteworthy examples of people who stepped up, did the right thing, and in fact, in some cases were injured, in some cases were were harmed seriously, in some cases even killed. So in certain kinds of settings, people absolutely do fear their personal safety with good reason. So it seems like there's this kind of herd mentality that happens when there's a group of people and one person's saying inappropriate things or picking on somebody else. What are some of the first steps someone can take to kind of separate themselves from this herd? What an important question. So I think one thing that's really important to understand is that in many cases, lots of other people in the setting might also be thinking the same thing that you are thinking yourself, but you feel like you're the only person. I love to give an example that I think many people can relate to, and that is the phenomenon of being in a college classroom in which the professor says, do you have any questions? And you, in fact, had a question, but as you start to raise your hand, you notice that no one else around you is raising their hand, and that leads you to put your hand down often because you're worried you're going to be the only one with a question, so surely it's a stupid question and you don't want to feel embarrassed. But in that setting, there are probably lots of other people who also had a question and failed to step up. So I think it's important for people to recognize that when you hear or see something problematic in a group setting, you might look to other people to say, is somebody else going to say something? And when nobody speaks up, you might falsely assume, well, I, I guess I'm the only one. But in reality, everybody might be looking to you as well. And so it's important to recognize that in many settings, there might be other people who share our view, and that can often give us more confidence for actually speaking up in the moment. Yeah, it's that indecision that kind of stops people going, gosh, maybe it's what I have isn't worthy enough, or maybe they're afraid of the professor and they just don't want to stand out. Absolutely. And the challenge is in that case, you're not raising your hand and you know why. You don't want to look stupid or feel embarrassed. But when you look around at everybody else and they're not raising their hands, you don't think that their behavior is driven by what's driving your behavior. You think they're just very smart. And that happens all the time when we think about our own behavior is being driven by something different from other people's behavior. Do you think sometimes people don't even get involved because they feel like if I say anything, it's going to escalate everything? Absolutely. And I think there are times in which people often worry, well, if I say something, how will people respond? Will people uh, overreact? Will people get mad at me? Will, in fact, this situation not just blow over? And I hear time and time again from people who say, well, you know, I spoke up about something that was happening in my office. And then, you know, I got in trouble or then I didn't get this promotion. I mean, we hear about consequences that whistleblowers face, for example, right? And so I think people do worry that speaking up, that saying something can actually escalate a problem, in some cases, even make it worse. And and that helps explain their decision to stay silent. I mean, you've got so much great research in this book, and it really outlines just the psychology behind all of this. Was there something that really stood out to you when you were doing the research? So one of the most interesting findings to me is that the psychology that underlies inaction is seen time and time again throughout history. So I'm a psychologist, and of course, the book is is based in research in psychology, But what was fascinating to me was that how much of the same psychology we can see play out throughout time. So in the book, I write about and and read a lot about Nazi Germany and how did people stay silent when we were seeing, of course, the horrible atrocities that occurred. And much of what happened in Nazi Germany is very, very familiar in terms of what research tells us about psychology. I would say that that was the thing that struck me again and again was how consistency in action in a fraternity house is similar psychologically to an action that happened in Nazi Germany is similar to an action that occurs in cases of corporate fraud and so on. As I was working on this book, there were many high profile examples of things that came out in the so-called Me Too movement. So people who knew clearly about what Harvey Weinstein was doing for years and, and failed to speak up, for example. And again, same concerns. Well, he's this 
powerful film producer and director and he's making or breaking career. So I can't really call out his bad behavior. So the psychology underlying in action is the same psychology if it's somebody working for Harvey Weinstein or somebody in a fraternity house, somebody who's staying silent during Nazi Germany. The psychology underlying that inaction is all the same. That's just remarkable. But when you, I mean, the way you broke it down, it makes sense though. When you look at that, it's like, wow, okay, this is all, this all has a similar thread in it. Well, and, and exactly. And that to me was what was so interesting is that all of these different examples, again, present day, but also historical are all rooted in the same reality. And the reality is that we are people, right? We are people. We have an innate human desire to be part of a group. It's probably evolutionarily adaptive that we depend on being part of our group for survival. There's fascinating research that I describe in the book, and I am not a neuroscientist, but there is fascinating research that's coming from the field of social neuroscience that now reveals that when you are ostracized or rejected by your social group, a particular part of your brain is activated. So it lights up, it fires. And that part of the brain is the exact same part of the brain that is activated when you experience physical pain, when you uh, have a paper cut, when you stub your toe, when you sprain your ankle. So that's a fascinating finding because what it tells us is that social pain feels like physical pain and we are highly motivated to avoid that kind of pain. And that explains why we really, as human beings, try to fit in with our group. Yeah, it's it's really remarkable how you have this all broken down. And I was surprised to read, like, if we feel connected to a person in need of help, how that affects us as well. That's such an important finding. So this idea that when we feel empathy for somebody, when we feel connected to a person, and, and that could be a person, of course, in our family or friendship group, but it could actually be a complete stranger, that when we feel empathy and connection for someone, we're actually more likely to be able to step up and take action, even if it potentially imposes costs on ourselves, as long as we feel that connection. And that's honestly part of the book that gives me real hope because it suggests a way that we can overcome people's perhaps natural tendency to stay silent by helping them develop connections and feel empathy for people around them. Yeah, what a big piece that is, because if we can have some empathy, then we're more connected to other people and really invested in what's going on. And and research has shown that in particular settings, when you can do things to foster empathy, you actually do get people stepping up, speaking out, and reducing bad behavior. Many of the most effective programs that are being used in school settings, in elementary schools, in junior highs, and high schools, are actually built on this idea of helping kids feel empathy for one another, helping kids feel empathy for kids who might be bullied, helping teachers and kids develop strong relationships so that kids feel they have support within the adults in their community. And those kinds of programs are, in fact, very effective at reducing not only bullying behavior, but also offensive language, you know, homophobic slurs, you know, racism and so on. Well, that's so, so important. And that's something that we really want people to understand is having that connection. I mean, we're all feeling connected. Those kind of things can kind of dissipate, I would think, in some way. Yes, a- absolutely. And, and what really gives me hope about that is that this is something that we can work on, right? That this is something that there is a human need to fit in and be a part of our group. But there's also an equally strong human need to feel empathy and connected for people. And when we can foster that sense, and we, of course, are talking at a time of, you know, great divide across the country in lots of different respects, that programs that try to create empathy and connection and perspective taking can actually lead people to be able to step up and risk experiencing consequences, risk experiencing rejection, as long as they can feel connected to somebody else. And that can make such a difference. I know in your book, you also share some stories of your personal journey where you connected with people and and just how you felt through it. 
Yes. So I think it's as a mom, I have, I have three kids as a mom. I was very, very mindful in writing this book that I really wanted to give other parents and frankly, people of all ages, tools and strategies that they can use. And so I talk, you know, very clearly in my book about times that I know I have failed to step up and do the right thing. And also times in which I've tried to put myself out there and do the right thing if I felt connected to and invested in in someone. I think it's also important to recognize that parents model speaking up for their children. So if you do interviews with people who stepped up and put themselves at great risk, whites who in the 1960s went down to southern parts of the United States and supported uh, voter registration efforts during the civil rights movement, Germans who risked their lives hiding Jews during the Holocaust. If you ask these people, well, what led you to put yourself at risk? You know, why did you do that? Overwhelmingly, they say the same thing. They say, my mom was always talking about helping other people. My dad was always putting himself out there, you know, making sure to help those who needed a you know, handout. And that kind of modeling for parents to do for children is fundamentally important. That's how we learn to be what I call a moral rebel. Well, I love how you shared this story about being in downtown Atlanta with your roommate and there was this guy passed out in front of the steps of the building. You guys called. And I love that story because a lot of times people are afraid to do these things. Well, right. And that's, and that's such a good example. So I was, I was in college. The guy was passed out on the stoop. My, my roommate and I were highly concerned. We called 911, you know, doing the right thing. And the police came and ridiculed us because the man was apparently a known drunk in the neighborhood. And, you know, they they made us feel, frankly, pretty stupid that we had done the right thing. Um, And yet uh, we were not exactly the heroes in this story. We looked sort of idiotic. But I do think that in that case, I I would far rather be the person who called and then felt silly than the person who walked right on by and and didn't stop and and help. You know, I applaud you. And I know while the well, it didn't work out. I mean, they, they should have at least thanked you for calling, regardless if he was known to them or not. You know, it makes a difference. I mean, I have called on people that are kind of passed out. I did on with one and the person had a drug overdose. And mm-hmm. if someone hadn't called, they would be dead. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you look at this and it's like, <laughs> you know, and, you know, busy traffic's going by, no one's caring. And it's like, come on. You know, it, I, th- I really applaud you for at least putting yourself out there. Well, and, and good for you for also making that call. And as you note, often it can be the, the, a difference of life or death if you're talking about a drug overdose when it could be, you know, a few moments that could literally make a difference. I also will point out that I think there are times in which just doing an act of kindness can be really appreciated. A couple of years ago, while I was working on this book, I was in the Atlanta airport and I was walking in that, you know, underground area where, you know, the, the trams are going from, from terminal to terminal. And I was on my phone and I passed a couple, a, I assume a husband and wife, standing beside a trash can. And the man was vomiting profusely into the trash can. And, and the wife was standing beside him, you know, with a lot of luggage around. And I walked past them talking on my cell phone. And then I had a moment of thinking, hmm, that's one of these things that I'm writing about in the book, you know, ignoring this situation. So I hung up the phone and I, and I walked back to them and I just said, excuse me, you know, may I help you? And the woman said, oh, well, he's just very sick. And I said, yes, yes, I know. And I said, but can I help you with something? And she said, you know, if you'd be willing to go get a wheelchair, that would be really helpful. And I said, absolutely. And I went up the escalator and I went to the Delta counter and I said, you know, excuse me, can somebody bring an an, uh, wheelchair to this couple? But that's an example in which, you know, I wasn't a big hero. I didn't save somebody's life. You know, it was this tiny little thing. But for that couple in that moment, my act of being willing to step up and offer to help was probably really appreciated. Oh, I'm sure they just loved you for that because it's tough, you know, when someone's not feeling well and needs help, you know, it's a tough situation. What, you know, with all the um, research that you've done in this book and the writings that you have with it, 
what are some ways that people can kind of overcome the feeling that, gosh, if I do something, it's going to cost me, or I might have to, um, I might get hurt, or I might, you know, be embarrassed. What are some ways they can overcome that? I'm so glad that you asked that question because that is why I wrote the book. <laughs> that I, I wrote the book because I'm really hoping that it gives people strategies. Uh, so this is what I'm going to say. I think many of us have been in situations where we see or hear something problematic and we don't say anything. We don't do anything. And like two days later, we're in the shower and we think, oh, that's what I should have done. Or, oh, that's what I could have said. And so what I'm trying to do is to give people some strategies that they can use so they don't have to think of the thing two days later when it's, when it's too late. So my suggestions are really to think ahead of time, what are some things that you could do? And in different situations, I frankly think there are different kinds of things that are most helpful. So we all know people who are certified in CPR. And when you get certified in CPR, you're certified regularly. They have you repeat the training every year or two. And the reason for that is they want you, if you are ever in a situation in which you need to give someone CPR, they want you to know what to do. And so I think similarly, we all need tools and strategies that we can use to step up. So One of these can actually be as simple as developing a phrase or a comment that calls out bad behavior in some way that doesn't make the person feel stupid or bad. So having a comment like, you know, I used to, you know, make jokes about that as well. And then I learned that, or I know you probably don't mean anything, you know, by that comment, but you know, that actually makes me feel. So you're therefore calling out a, maybe an offensive, you know, racist, sexist, homophobic joke or comment, but you're doing it in a way that that's drawing attention to how it might make you feel and not making the person feel stupid or bad. So I think that's one strategy. Have a, a set of phrases that you can use that you feel okay about. Another strategy is to frankly find a friend. Having somebody else with you in a situation can often give people the courage to step up. You can share your thoughts and feelings with that person. They can give you more courage. So sometimes it's as simple as finding somebody else to give you a little bit of extra courage. Another really important point, which you and I have already talked about, creating empathy. When I was working on this book, it occurred to me that if my son was passed out in a dorm room, I would really want somebody to call immediately. If my daughter was on a bus in Boston and somebody was yelling things at her, I would really want somebody to step up and go over and sit with her. So I think one of the most important things we can do is to really actively try to see the world from somebody else's perspective and develop and foster that empathy. And that's also something that can help us step up in all sorts of situations. So what are your tips in dealing with bullies? I know we kind of started our discussion there and it just, I mean, you had such a, um, gosh, a story just really tugged at my heart about Mallory Rose, you know, and just her, how she was bullied basically. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. Yes. This is the, this, the, the opening of chapter six, which is a chapter on bullying. And Mallory was in sixth grade at a, middle school in New Jersey and was really, really tormented by some classmates, including cyberbullying. And Mallory ultimately died by suicide. And I will say that story also tugged at my heartstrings. I've actually been in touch with Mallory's mom, uh, who really appreciated my sharing her story in this book and, and is really hoping that my book will give parents and educators tools and strategies they can use to reduce the episodes of bullying. What the research on bullying shows time and time again is that most kids don't like bullies. Most kids think bullies are not good people. They're not nice. They're not popular. They're not well-liked. And yet bullying continues because kids individually worry, well, if I step up and say something, will I then become a target? But the good news is There are lots of things that parents and schools can do to reduce bullying, including creating a school climate that values and fosters kindness and empathy instead of one that values bullying or one that at least tolerates bullying even as a problem. It's also clear that in which 
children, teenagers feel connected and supported by school personnel goes a long way towards reducing bullying, possibly by helping students feel more comfortable reporting it at low levels to teachers before it gets uh, out of hand. Research has also shown that schools that foster empathy, that foster perspective taking, can also help reduce bullying. So there are lots of things that schools and educators and parents can do to reduce bullying and hopefully reduce future tragedies like what happened to Mallory. You've mentioned a couple of times about really developing empathy. For parents that are looking to instill that in their children, what are some things they should know? So I think what, what what's important to recognize is that there are some people who appear to be naturally higher in empathy, that, that this seems to be a pretty consistent finding that some people just more naturally and easily see the world through somebody else's perspective. But empathy, like many things, can also be fostered. It's like a muscle. You can exercise it. You can develop it. And a really important strategy is to basically have children try to think about the world through somebody else's perspective. And that can be as simple as saying, you know, during holiday times, you know, some children don't have as many resources as other children. So we are going to donate food or toys or winter coats to children in need in our community. It can be making a decision as a family to try to do acts of kindness around you to help people who are less comfortable or less well-off than you are. It can be actively trying to work to help people who are in positions of relative privilege. Imagine how it would be if you went through the world and you were treated like this. So basically, parents can have a tremendous influence in terms of helping to foster empathy and develop this idea of perspective taking, seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. I'm so glad that you broke that down because at least gives people a place to start. I think sometimes all of this can be a little overwhelming for people. They're like, well, where do I even start? Where do I go? And I, I really loved your book because it gives people information case studies and and just like okay how do we move through this together well thank you thank you so much for those kind words about it and honestly i was really hoping i am really hoping that once people understand the very normal psychological factors that lead people to stay silent once we understand that psychology we also can learn tools to speak up but i think sometimes people sort of divide the world into there are good people and there are bad people and although of course there are some people who are you know really really awful people there are many many people who are very good people and who just don't know how to step up, how to intervene in particular situations. Although my book is called Why We Act, that is the official title. The title that I wanted, which I lost on, as you can tell, um, the title that I wanted was The Appalling Silence of the Good People, which is Ooh. a wonderful quote. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> um, I love course, that. I do too. That's why I'm sharing it. So that's so. The, the title that I wanted was The Appalling Silence of the Good People, which is a wonderful quote by Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and I think the, the publisher sort of thought, well, you know, appalling, you know, makes people feel kind of bad. But really, honestly, I think there are lots of very good people who are appallingly silent. And I'm hoping that my book helps all of us good people understand why they're silent and gives them real and practical tools and strategies they can use to step up. I get that. I mean, I've got regrets on a couple of situations where I did not stand up and I vowed I would never do that again. But it's interesting because those things haunt you. And I'd rather have, I mean, gosh, I'm so glad that we have your book because I'd rather have this information that helps me navigate through this than not do anything at all. Well, absolutely. And what's been fascinating to me over the last, you know, six months or so, as I've had all of these different interviews and conversations about my book, everybody says exactly what you just said. There are times in which I'm haunted. And that's, and that's the phrase they use. And people tell me, sometimes it's 30 years ago. I remember, like people are literally describing, I was in this airport. I was in a hotel lobby. I was in a grocery store. I was whatever. And they have these things, these moments. And, and I describe very honestly in the book, I have those moments. So I talk about a time I was in college 
and I was uh, driving to a meeting. I was driving with my boss. My boss was driving and we were running late for a meeting that he had to present at and he couldn't find a parking space. So he pulled into a handicapped spot and this man was, you know, perfectly abled. He did not need a handicapped spot. So he pulled into this handicapped spot. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was bad. And we got out of the car and I like looked at the handicap, you know, sign. And then I looked at him and he smirked at me and then started limping into the building. That was what he did. And I knew it was wrong. And I, and I, again, that was 30 years ago. And I can still remember it vividly as I'm telling it to you, but I didn't say anything. I I wanted a letter of recommendation. I wanted him to like me. I wanted him to potentially hire me. I didn't say a word. And, And that's exactly the kind of thing that happens to all of us. And my book is hopefully helping people understand that their experience of not speaking up is very normal, but we also have a choice. And, and I give some strategies that people could use if they want to exercise that choice. Okay. So you brought up work. Okay. So let's dive into this because there's so much that happens at work. Is there a way that we can like foster being more ethical at work? So I think it really honestly depends on where you are in your career. So I get this question a lot. I've done a number of talks for, you know, big corporations and corporate compliance agencies and so on. In all honesty, I think it depends on where you are in your career. So for people who are relatively junior in their career, they're just starting out, it's really hard to make waves because if you were to say something or call out bad behavior, especially on behalf of, you know, your boss or somebody that you report to, um, it, it can be problematic in terms of your career. So what I think are a few things. I think, first of all, organizations actually benefit substantially from ethical employees, that ethical leadership pays off. And so we often sort of think, well, you know, cutting corners is the way of the world. But what research shows is that corporations in which the CEO is not modeling good behavior actually do less well, because eventually cutting corners not engaging in ethical behavior comes back to haunt you. I also think that it's really important for people who are high enough and established enough in their careers to model good behavior. And that could include calling out problematic behavior so that they are modeling and identifying to other people that they're not okay with what's happening. And whether that's engaging in inappropriate conduct in the office in terms of, you know, racist language, in terms of discriminatory hiring or promoting practices. But it can also be, you know, levels of fraud and many high profile examples of corporate fraud. A lot of people knew what was going on and a lot of people didn't speak up. So how can they, you know, for employees at a a corporation, how can employees help to create a culture of speaking up? So I think one thing is that it's very important to recognize that many acts of bad behavior of all kinds happen in a slippery slope, that it's not the case that bad behavior necessarily happens at a really extreme and obvious level. So it's important to recognize that little steps can be problematic. If you do interviews with people who've been convicted of various kinds of white collar crime. Overwhelmingly, they say, well, you know, initially I just did this and then it escalated. If you do interviews with a Bernie Madoff, for example, has described often big acts of fraud start with very, very small little steps. And so it's important that people don't just excuse low levels of bad behavior because if you get away with doing something once, it escalates over time. It's, it's really important for people in a meeting or in any kind of work environment. If somebody does or says something problematic, it's important to call out that behavior, either directly at that moment or shortly after. Because if bad behavior is not called out, it tends to escalate and it tends to get worse. Yeah, and then you've got morale going down and then you have a culture that no one wants to be a part of. Well, and everybody is also imitating it. So because people also say, well, you know, so-and-so, you know, is doing this. So obviously it's okay if I do so the same. And it becomes very, very hard to change the culture when it starts going in that direction. So in your book, you talk about a moral rebel. What is that? And why is that something we should be aware of? So a moral rebel is the term that psychologists use to basically describe people who 
don't tend to stay silent, that moral rebels feel pretty comfortable speaking up and calling out bad behavior of all kinds. And that could be in, in high schools, it could be calling out bullying, it could be in a corporate environment, you know, calling out sexist language, etc. So moral rebels are basically people who don't fall prey to what most of us fall prey to, which is this pressure to stay silent and not call out bad behavior, that moral rebels actually do speak up. Yeah, they, they've got the courage to do that. So in situations where it's needed, how can we find our own inner moral rebel? So that's really ultimately the goal. So what do we know about moral rebels? Well, first, as you and I have discussed, they're high in empathy. So part of being a moral rebel probably means that you really feel someone else's pain as your own, and that probably makes it easier to step up. So some of the things that we've talked about before in terms of developing greater empathy, that can help. Another factor, though, that moral rebels tend to hold is that they're good at arguing. And I, I, I like this example very much as, as somebody with an argumentative 16-year-old daughter, that research has actually shown that teenagers who argue with their moms are better at standing up to peer pressure. And what the researchers think is that you actually develop skills and an ability to represent your own view and to stand up for you, what you believe in by arguing with your parents. So you're basically practicing. And so moral rebels also seem to be pretty good at expressing their views and standing up for what they believe in. So actually some practice having disagreements helps. The other thing that we see in moral rebels is that they don't seem to really care about feeling embarrassed, about sticking out. So they're low in factors described as social inhibition. They're just, they don't really care about feeling embarrassed or doing the wrong thing or whatever. And that means that the normal factors that lead many of us to stay silent don't seem to impact them in the same way. They sound like a, a unicorn in the group there, right? <laughs> so. well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good analogy that, that, again, they're not that many moral rebels. You know, they're not that many moral rebels, although we can also see people time and time again throughout history and present day who are the whistleblowers, who have called out bad behavior and sometimes experienced really big consequences for doing so. But you are right. It is not normal. And I, and I like the analogy of a unicorn. Well, I think unicorn's a great way to describe it because of just how it feels. My goodness, you know, and, and your book really had me thinking. I have to tell you this. I, I read it. And I'm like, hmm, there's a lot here for me to consider. What do you want readers to take away from your book? So I want readers to take away that the factors that lead most of us non-unicorn, non-moral rebels uh, to stay silent are very, very consistent. And, and in fact, it's, it's very normal to worry about how do you fit in. It's very normal to worry about uh, feeling embarrassed or to worry about saying or doing the wrong thing. And that those very normal concerns lead us to stay silent. But we all have the potential to step up and do the right thing in all kinds of situations, even if it's our, not our natural inclination. And we can get better at doing so with practice. And to me, ultimately, we all want to live in a world in which people call out bad behavior so that bad behavior doesn't continue and doesn't hurt us, doesn't hurt our loved ones, doesn't impair our workplace, and so on. And we all, I think, have a collective responsibility to try to develop, to foster our own inner moral rebel so that we can live in a world that's better. And that's all within our own control. Yeah, there definitely used to be an era where someone would say something bad and you'd have a group of people standing up. I need to develop that again. It feels like it was something that happened so long ago, but you know, I don't think that it was. No, and I love your example of wouldn't it be wonderful to be in such a world, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be in such a world in which that was what was normal? Uh, I love that. <laughs> I think that I think that's something we all want because you know, no one wants to deal with bullies, but you know, unless we do deal with them, they continue to be bullies. Well, exactly. And, and I think the reality is that we can imagine 
a world changing. And that's the key is the first step is imagining the world can change. And I'll give an example, which will, which will clearly date me in terms of my age to your listeners. Um, and, and maybe you can share if you identify as well. Um, but I am old enough that I remember when you would buy a seat on an airplane, you would choose smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That Did invisible you know? barrier, right? <laughs> yeah, right? That invisible barrier. Now I'll tell you when I, when I say that to my college students, they're like, what are you talking about? But there's an example in which that now seems laughable, right? It seems laughable that, that, that you would buy a seat on an airplane, that people would smoke at an airplane, that that was an option. And that's an example about how much our culture has changed, right? That it seems laughable when you and I describe something that we both experienced being on a plane with smokers. And, and that's an example about how our culture can change. So now imagine what if our culture changed and people called out bad behavior so it didn't continue. Wouldn't that be lovely? Ah, oh, I would love that. I would love that. You know, and while some things have changed, like you know, no more smokers on planes, we don't have to worry about the stinky ashtray in the armrest. You know, having people <laughs> who actually stand up to bullies, we need that. You know, <laughs> well, we do, we do. And and I, when I've given talks on this subject, uh, many times someone will come up and they will say this book and your talk should be mandatory for all high school students. Because imagine if we did this sort of education and training in high school, then students would arrive at college and maybe we wouldn't hear about things like sexual assault and and hazing and fraternity deaths and so on. And maybe then people wouldn't go into the workplace and engage in sexual misconduct or bullying or corporate fraud. That if we could actually change the culture, so what is normal and what is accepted is people speaking up and calling out bad behavior, then that behavior would not continue. What we see time and time again is that many people find the same kinds of things problematic. And yet, if no one speaks up and no one says anything, then that behavior continues in all kinds of settings. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you look at the colleges and talk about sexual assault. You know, it's basically like we're training people you know, mostly young boys, how to be inappropriate and get away with it. So when we do that, they go into the workplace with that learned behavior. And and what's so fascinating about that psychologically is that that happens even when individually, many, many of these boys and young men probably find the behavior problematic. I, I remember talking about this book with a really good student, one of my thesis students on the basketball team, super smart kid, And he's sitting in my office and we're talking about this book. And he said, you know, every day in the locker room, someone says something offensive. (laughs) And sometimes I speak up and sometimes I don't. And, And what struck me when he said that is that it's distinctly possible that when an offensive thing is said, everybody else in the locker room is also saying, that's problematic, that's offensive. And yet none of them are speaking up. Mm, that's so true. That is so true. Oh my goodness, Catherine. I mean, we could talk for hours. <laughs> I just, I loved your book, Why We Act. I think turning bystanders into moral rebels is something everyone should be learning how to do. <laughs> you know. Well, thank you for this opportunity to talk. As you can tell, I'm super passionate about this topic. <laughs> and again, I had the modest goal of writing this book to change the world. So um, give me, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic of inaction and how to develop our own moral rebel, or as you would say, our unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> so where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about not just this book, but your other work and be part of your community. Super. Thanks for asking. So I have a website, which is sandersonspeaking.com. And I'm on Instagram posting regularly. I'm also at Sanderson Speaking. So would love to connect. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you for this invitation to talk and stay safe. Well, thank you, Catherine. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Why We Act turning bystanders into moral rebels. Why We Act is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. 
And of course, it's available on Kindle. Again, if you'd like to connect with Catherine, you can at sandersonspeaking.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.